Glory to Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Today, brothers and sisters, I'm going to be sharing about friend or foe concerning the Lord. The Lord has a sword that comes out of his mouth, and it's a double-edged sword. And there are two sides to that sword. And so we will find out that we can be on the one end or on the other end of the same sword, and it has two edges. Friend or foe? We go to the scriptures, James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Abraham was called a friend of God. And when you're a friend of God, that has consequences. We go to John chapter 15, verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. And so when you are a friend of the Lord, you are in the knowing of the Lord and what he is doing. You are not simply a servant, but a friend, and you have access to the status of a confidant with the Lord, where you have access to sensitive information. As you can remember, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 17, we read, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And this is in the context of the Lord, having decided that he would go down on the earth to find out if indeed the iniquity of Sodom and Gomorrah had reached the heights that had been reported to the Lord, the heights of sin. And so the Lord was going to go down, and having seen that the iniquity of Sodom and Gomorrah abounded and was full, the Lord decided that he would destroy these places. And he asked, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Because as a friend of the Lord, as a friend of God, you are now on the inside of his plan and can have access to the information that pertains to what he intends to do. And so Abraham was going to be informed of things to come, of events to come, and here more precisely the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, because Abraham was called a friend of God, because he believed on God and it was counted to him for righteousness. We are talking about the two edges of the sword. And so, if we're talking about the two edges of the sword, it therefore means that as a friend, you may be on one side of that sword, looking at one edge of it, but there is another side, another edge, and that edge, you will find the enemies of the Lord there, and they are not his friends. We go to James chapter 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. How interesting that the word friend is used here once again. But there are different types of friendships. You may call friendship a certain type of relationship, but it may be a relationship that is rooted in the world. It may be that the friendship you speak of and allude to is the friendship according to the wisdom of this world and not, rather, according to the wisdom of God. Because the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of God are different. And so there is a friendship that you can have with God, as we saw with Abraham, whereby you believe on him and have faith in him and therefore are called a friend of God. 
But if you choose to be a friend of the world, meaning that you abide by the wisdom of this world, though you be a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. And therefore, be careful who you call a friend. And then again, what type of friendship you are referring to. Because indeed, brothers and sisters, those who will be enemies of God, friends of the world, there is a judgment that will befall them. The sword will not spare them. We go to Nahum chapter 1, verse 2. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. You see here, you see the word enemy, and you don't have a tendency at first glance to associate it with friendship because you see enmity. But by way of James chapter 4, verse 4, do you now see that being an enemy can also be rooted in the fact that you're a friend, but a friend to the world, which makes it enmity with God, and God reserveth wrath for his enemies, because we know that he doth not acquit the wicked. Hallelujah. And so before we get to a passage that I want to highlight in the book of Exodus, we now just take a moment to really make sure we have understood what we have laid out thus far. There are those who are friends of God and they abide in the faith. And there are those who abide in the friendship of this world, which is enmity with God. And there are consequences associated with both positions. There are consequences associated with being seated on the one edge of the sword rather than on the other edge of the sword, the two-edged sword. On the one hand, as a friend, you are on the one edge of the sword. And on the other hand, as an enemy of God, you are on the other end of the sword and you will face judgment, the wrath of God reserved for you. Just like we know in the book of Jude, where you have angels that are chained in darkness awaiting the day of judgment. And therefore they are already condemned in darkness, chained, waiting for the judgment. They are already on the one side of the two-edged sword the one where judgment and condemnation awaits and befalls those who have made themselves enemies of God. Paul also speaks of those who seem to preach Christ, but in truth, they are enemies of God, enemies of the cross of Christ. Alleluia. And so we get to Exodus chapter 13, and we're still talking about the two-edged sword. Now, in Exodus chapter 13, we will find out that the Lord, being in the midst of people, will not be perceived the same way, depending on which side of the sword you are positioned. We will be looking at that in detail. Let us first read Exodus chapter 13. We start at verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, from before the people. And so you remember here that the people of the Lord are coming out of Egypt and in the desert, the Lord is leading them. And so we read that by day, they are led by a pillar of a cloud and by night, a pillar of fire. We now go to Exodus chapter 14, verse 17. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. 
and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. Verse 18, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Notice here that we are talking about the angel of God when God previously said that he would come down. And so the angel of God here, a representation of God himself. Surprisingly, God comes amongst the people in the old covenant on numerous occasions, and we don't have an issue with that. But then in the new covenant, when God decides to come and indwell a human vessel, then it seems to create controversy for some. Nonetheless, this is a different issue. And so we get back to verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. Have you seen this, brothers and sisters? The same Lord, the same angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. So the pillar of the cloud was now behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. So you see here the image of the two-edged sword. The pillar of the cloud becomes a sword. It separates. It separates between the Egyptians on the one hand and Israel on the other. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. And so on the one edge of the sword, it was a cloud and darkness for those who were abiding in that position. For the Egyptians, the sword, God, the light of the world, appeared to them as a cloud and darkness because they had not the understanding of him, because they had not faith in him, it was given to them to be veiled and perceive him as a cloud and darkness, though he is the almighty God, and though he be in the midst of two people, yet these two people, being on different sides of the same sword, do not perceive him the same way. And so you see that the same God, the same angel of God, by way of you having come to know him, or not, depending on the knowledge that you have of him, he will either appear to you as cloud and darkness, or he will give you light. But it gave light by night to these. So there are two groups. There is them and there is these. Them, the Egyptians, darkness. These, the camp of Israel, light. Listen to the rest of the verse now, verse 20, so that the one came not near the other all the night. Oh, hallelujah. And so the sword created a separation. Remember in Luke chapter 16, the rich man in hell observed that there was a gulf between him and the poor man Lazarus, who was in Abraham's bosom. There is a gulf fixed such that those who would want to cross over to the other side could not do it. There was a separation. There was a gap that could not be overcome. And here you have that image here in verse 20 of the sword, the separation between two categories of people. Those who are on the side of the Lord, 
the camp of Israel and those who have made themselves enemies of God, the Egyptians, the friends and the foes. We are talking about the two-edged sword, friend or foe. We are looking at ourselves today, brothers and sisters, on which side of the two-edged sword are you? The same God, the one sword, two edges. On the one end, you will see God as light. You will have an opportunity to have a glimpse of his light. But if you be on the other side as a foe, rather than being a friend, as a foe, you will be in darkness. If you happen to be positioned on the side, on the edge of the sword that gives light, by way of being a friend to the Lord, then you shall perceive that light. But if you so happen to have made yourself an enemy of God, being on the edge of the sword, the side where the foes are found, then he shall be darkness unto thee. The Lord creates a separation. For he wields not the sword in vain. As you know, brothers and sisters, it is not given to everybody to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God. We go to Mark chapter 4. We are at verse 11. This is Jesus with his disciples after he has removed himself from the crowd so that he can be isolated with a smaller group of people. Verse 11, And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. And so the image of the parables here is darkness, meaning that those to whom the understanding is not given are veiled, and therefore they perceive not the light, but abide in darkness, and they don't have the understanding of the parables. That's the image of being in darkness. If you remember in John chapter 9, when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, in the case of this man who was born blind, the Pharisees asked Jesus, are we blind? And Jesus told them, yes, you are blind, meaning you don't understand the parables, meaning you abide in darkness, meaning you have set yourselves in a position of being foes and enemies of God by your hearts that are hardened. And this creates a veil before your eyes that makes it so you are blind. You don't understand parables. You don't have understanding and therefore cannot perceive my light. Verse 11 again, and he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Verse 12, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. And so there are people whose understanding the Lord even clouds with darkness so that they cannot perceive his light because it is not given them to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. And such are those who set themselves and have set themselves as enemies of God, as foes standing on the one side of the sword where the edge is for judgment and condemnation. And so the Egyptians had done that by resisting the Lord. And the Pharisees had done the same with their hardened hearts and resisted the Lord's teachings when he came to abide in the vessel of flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he explains to his disciples that some will see the light, some will see the pillar of fire as it gives light, as the light comes into the world and comes unto his own, but some will have the darkness of the cloud and be veiled their understanding not being opened to perceive that light, and they are blind 
and they die in their sins and face judgment and condemnation. They are enemies of God, the foes. Whereas those to whom it is given to see the truth of the Almighty, they are his friends. And having not loved the world, they are not his enemies, but his friends. Not just servants, but even friends who are in the knowing of things to come, to whom the understanding of biblical prophecy is open. And so, as we just discussed, there are the foes on the one side of the edge of the sword who are veiled. They abide in darkness, a cloud and darkness unto them, the Egyptians. Just like nowadays, there are people who do not have the understanding of the mystery of the kingdom of God. They are friends of the world. They abide on the side of the edge of the sword that is for judgment, and they have made themselves enemies of God. They are foes, and God reserveth wrath unto them. And the devil has caught them in a snare and is keeping them in darkness because he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He is a liar from the beginning. And when he speaketh naturally, he speaketh a lie. And this is the work of Satan. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four. In whom the God of this world, that is Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Satan has taken part in the setting up of that veil, that cloud of darkness, that veils the unbeliever. We continue the verse, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them, lest they would perceive the light that is emitted by the pillar of fire. That same pillar of fire, who is able to appear as light to those who believe unto salvation, but as a cloud and darkness unto those whose hardened hearts will not receive it, or having received it, will turn from it, having preferred this world, the present evil world corrupt with lust. And we may ask, how is it that they're not able to see through the veil? How is it that they're not able to set themselves free? Only the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, can set you free. Only his truth can set you free. The light of the world. You need to have his light shine on you and to understand by way of the light that he provides the parables that he is speaking unto you but he speaks them in a language that is a mystery. It is a language that is different from the language of this world. First John chapter four, verse five, they are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world and the world heareth them. And so you see that the parables that are spoken of the Lord, that's not a language that is of the world, but those who are veiled, they speak of the world, and they have a language that is of the world rooted in the wisdom of this world, which does not allow them to have enlightenment concerning the things spoken by the Lord, the things that pertain to heavenly things. The Lord will say, if you can't understand earthly things, how will you understand spiritual things? If you have spiritual understanding, you can understand all things, spiritual and earthly. But the people of the world have their own language concerning the things of the earth. But that is not sufficient for you to understand the things in heaven. And it may even be that you don't even have full comprehension of the earthly things that you are discussing. How then is there hope for you to understand spiritual things? Verse 6, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. Those who are of the Lord. The sheep of the Lord, they hear his voice and they follow him because they recognize that voice. They will not follow a stranger, 
They cannot be duped. And so the false light that the devil brings, the false voice of the imposter, it will not dupe the sheep of the Lord. Because the sheep of the Lord will recognize the voice of the good shepherd. But those who are veiled, those who are taken at will by the devil and whose understanding he clouds, they can be deceived by that imposter's voice that sounds like it could be the voice of a shepherd, but it's not the good shepherd's voice. But they can be fooled concerning that and they will follow a teacher of lies. We finish verse 6. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And so when you have the spirit of truth, you can understand the truth. But when you have the spirit of error, though you believe to be in the truth, you are not. But yet you are convinced that you are in the truth and you are in error. And so the Egyptians, they did not see the fire, the light of the pillar of fire. They were exposed to darkness, to a cloud and darkness. And notice that even though they were in that predicament, it did not stop them from continuing to chase after. It did not stop them from continuing to pursue this is to show you that just like Saul, who was troubled by an evil spirit and was even aware that his mind was not right because it was shown him that he was pursuing a man who was more righteous than him by his own admission. David could have slain Saul, but didn't. And he told him that. And Saul had understanding of these things. But because his heart was in error, because he was troubled by an evil spirit, even in his confusion, he continued to chase after David. You see that? And the Egyptians who were in darkness, though they were in confusion, though they were troubled by the lack of knowledge and understanding of their surroundings, they continued to pursue the camp of Israel. Do you see how when you are filled with evil, there is a drive about you to go and persecute the righteous? And even when you find yourself in confusion, you feel like you have to continue to do that. You are driven to persecution. Although you have no light and you abide in the darkness and embrace it, though it has you in a state of confusion. And so Saul chased after David being in confusion troubled by an evil spirit. The Egyptians chased after the camp of Israel, troubled by darkness and confusion, but they kept on pursuing. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We are talking about the two edges of the sword, the two-edged sword, where there are friends on the one side and foes on the other facing the judgment and condemnation of the one edge of the sword that is to slay the wicked. Whereas the righteous, there is another edge of the sword which cuts, which separates them from iniquity because there is no fellowship between light and darkness. What fellowship is there between Christ and Belial? And so there is a separation unto salvation. There is a setting apart. There is a consecration. There is a making up of the jewels on that day after that they have been separated, taken out of darkness and brought into the marvelous light. And that is the other edge of the sword. The sword unto salvation, it separates. It brings division. It separates the righteous from wickedness, so that the righteous, the friends, can be a chaste virgin, so that they can have a white robe. They're separated from the filth of this world, having been commanded to not love the world, neither the things that are in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. 
they have been separated from these things. And therefore they abide not in darkness, but are on the side, the edge of the sword, that is a separation unto salvation. Whereas the others, the enemies of God, those who have set themselves as foes, enemies of God, they are on the side of the sword, the edge of the sword, that is unto judgment and condemnation. Are you a friend or a foe of God? Are you able to perceive the light which is emitted by the pillar of fire? Or are you caught in a cloud of darkness? I pray that you be able to see the light. Amen. But in order to see that light, you have to love God, which means that you have to obey his commandments, as we know. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. But if any man love God, if any man obey the commandments of God, the same is known of him. God knoweth those who are his. Those who have his spirit are his, and those who don't have his spirit are none of his. And those who don't have his spirit are not known of him. And so those who are known of God are not going to be the ones for whom judgment is reserved in terms of reserving his wrath for them. They are not on the edge of the sword unto judgment and condemnation, but rather because they have sowed in righteousness, they will reap eternal life, being friends of God, having communion with God in light. But for those who are foes and who have sowed unto wickedness, they will reap eternal condemnation as foes, enemies of God, on the other side of the edge of the sword. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Depart from me. And so there are those who see the light and those who are caught in a cloud and darkness. And we saw that it is because they're unable to perceive the things that pertain to the kingdom. They don't understand the mystery of the kingdom of God. The language spoken by the Lord is not familiar to them. They don't recognize that voice. But in order to understand the things of the spirit, in order to understand the things of God, it must be given you. And how do you understand these things by the Spirit? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. No one can come to the Father unless he first draw him to himself. And then he gives you understanding of his person. When you receive his spirit, it allows you to understand who he is because the spirit is the witness. First John 5, 6. But when you receive his spirit, you come into the knowing of his being, of his person, or at least part of who he is, because he cannot be contained. That he may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, a wisdom that is not the wisdom of this world, but a heavenly wisdom, and also revelation in the knowledge of him. You need that revelation. If you don't have that revelation, you will be like Nicodemus, you will have truth in front of you, but you won't be able to recognize that truth. You will not understand the language of parables. You will be caught in spiritual darkness concerning your understanding. You remember how in Luke chapter 24, verse 45, the Lord opened the understanding of his disciples so that they would understand scripture. There are different 
types of understanding that we must acquire. And it is done by the Lord himself who opens our intelligence. And here we are speaking about the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Certainly the Egyptians who were abiding in a cloud of darkness did not have access to that wisdom that is heavenly, to the revelation of the knowledge of the Almighty. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, seeing the fire from the pillar, the light of the world, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And so the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And this is interesting because we just spoke about not being able to see when you are in darkness. And there is a correlation made between the ability to see, but from a perspective of understanding the things that are heavenly, understanding the things that pertain to the kingdom. And so you must receive enlightenment concerning that or else you are spiritually blind and you are in a cloud and darkness and you cannot see. Your eyes do not receive the light that they need for your understanding to be open. He was a pillar of fire to the camp of Israel and he was a cloud and darkness unto the Egyptians, being in the midst of them, being in the middle, and yet they did not perceive the same thing about the same being, the same God, who stood in the midst, creating a division, separating, because there was a group to whom it was given to understand. There was a group to whom it was given to see the fire, the light, and there was another group on the other side, on the other edge of the sword, the two-edged sword that was kept in darkness, plunged therein and destined to judgment and condemnation. Taken in the snare of the devil who veils the understanding. First Corinthians chapter one, verse five that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. And so when we are talking about the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of the Lord, it is he himself who is the source of that knowledge because we are enriched by him in all utterance, in the way that we speak, and in all knowledge, in the way that we have knowledge, he is the source of it and he enriches us in knowledge. A knowledge rooted in the heavenly wisdom and not in the wisdom of man. And so this brings us back to the idea that we have to be able to perceive him and his light, to be enriched by him. But if we are cut off and veiled from him, we cannot be enriched and we are poor and we are deprived of light and plunged in darkness and confusion. And left, of course, without the knowledge of him, without the understanding of parables, without the understanding of heavenly things. And so there is a difference between a friend and a foe, a friend who is in the knowing and a foe who is in darkness having no understanding because he is veiled and his understanding is covered, veiled. And to some we have seen it is given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom and to others it is not. First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We have seen that if a man love God, that is, if a man obey his commandments, he is known of him. And so we can read, therefore, that God hath prepared for them that love him certain things, 
Verse 9 again, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You cannot see and perceive. You cannot hear and understand. Such things cannot enter into your heart, the things that pertain to the mysteries of the kingdom, unless God has prepared it for you to receive it. Unless God knows you, unless you love God and obey his commandments and are known of him. Verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, the deep things of God. The understanding for these concepts is above the level of understanding that you use for earthly things. And so it is by his spirit that you receive these things. Which again brings us to what we saw earlier about having the spirit of wisdom and of the revelation in the knowledge of him. And so by his spirit, we come into the knowledge of him. And having his spirit, we are enriched by him so that we can understand the deep things of God because it was given unto us to understand these things because we know him, we love him, we obey his commandments, we are known of him because we have his spirit. Because if we do not, we are none of his. But for those who are his, he opens up their understanding and enriches them in knowledge by his spirit. Why? Because if you do not have the spirit, you are left with a carnal mind to try to understand heavenly things. And that doesn't work. Verse 11, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Only by way of the spirit can you understand the things that pertain to God. That's why it was says in Mark chapter 4, we had read starting at verse 11, unto you it is given to understand the mystery of the kingdom. Unto you it is given by the spirit to have your understanding opened, to see the fire, to see the light that is emitted by the pillar of fire. Without the spirit, you are veiled. Your understanding is veiled by the prince of this world, the God of this world, so that you cannot see the light. And therefore you cannot come into the truth. You cannot acquire the wisdom that you need to understand the things of the Lord. And you don't have the revelation of his person and the knowledge of him. And you abide as a foe on that one side of the two edged sword where you are in darkness, a cloud and darkness and appointed unto destruction as judgment looms, for you are an enemy of God, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. But if you have the Spirit, loving him, obeying his commandments, being in the light, perceiving the fire of that pillar that separated you unto holiness, then you are in the knowing as a friend of God. Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I am about to do? No. Biblical prophecy is now available for you to understand, to know what is going to happen in the plan of the Lord. You are not in darkness. To not know what is in store for humanity. And this is why the scriptures also say, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you are not as children of the night so that you would be caught by surprise by that day because you know the times and the seasons and they do not being veiled. But you are having the word as a lamp and knowing biblical prophecy and the understanding of it by the Spirit. We are talking about the sword, the separation 
the two-edged sword and the two edges, two groups of individuals. We are talking about friends of God and foes, enemies of God. We are talking about light and we're talking about darkness. So we just spoke about having the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him. When you don't have that spirit, you're going to have problems because the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit. For instance, in John chapter 14, verse nine, Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? And so here the Lord is asking Philip, how is it that you cannot tell who is standing in front of you? That you do not understand that the Father as a spirit is indwelling the vessel of flesh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And yet you want to know me when I have manifested myself through the person of the man, Jesus Christ, whom I am indwelling as a spirit, me, the Father. This is a very good illustration to show you who has the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of God. Those who have it understand this passage very naturally. God was in Christ. The Father was in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.19. But those who don't have the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of God, they will have hours long debates about this verse, trying to use their human intellect to determine what it means. Because it is by the spirit as a friend that you come into the intimate knowing of the things of the kingdom, the mysteries of the kingdom, and the knowledge of the Lord by the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him and the spirit of wisdom. And so Philip here had yet to come fully into the understanding. And this passage is used to show us that unless we receive these things, we are going to be left with trying to figure out with our carnal mind things that are very simple if you have the spiritual understanding opened, if you are able to be enlightened by the pillar of fire as a friend of God, as someone who is known of God, as someone who loves God, obeys his commandments, as someone who has his spirit and belongs to him, rather than someone who is not able to perceive that light, being veiled, being in a cloud and darkness, and therefore being unable to know him, and therefore being unable to come to the knowledge of his person, because they have not known him, and it is not given them to see and perceive, to hear and understand, and therefore they are in confusion and they don't have spiritual understanding that you can only acquire by the Spirit. And it was the case, for instance, for Nicodemus. Without the Spirit, without having his understanding opened, he was not able to grasp spiritual concepts, heavenly things. And so here Philip, not yet having come into the full understanding of things, is not able to wrap his mind around spiritual concepts that are clear to anybody who has the Holy Spirit. Having an anointing to be taught all things that pertain to the revelation of the knowledge of God. Hallelujah. Are you a friend of God or a foe? an enemy of God? Are you able to perceive the light, the fire of the pillar, or do you abide in a cloud and darkness? We are looking at this today because we're talking about the sword. We're talking about a two-edged sword that cometh out of the mouth 
of he who is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the one who is, was, and is to come, the Almighty, the beginning and the end. The one who holds the keys of death and hell, the one who is life, the one who first descended and then ascended so that he would be in all things, so that he would encompass all things. We are talking about him. Hallelujah. And so there are things you can only acquire by way of seeing the light of the pillar of fire, by way of having the spirit, by way of receiving through the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, things that pertain to God and his person and his being. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Jesus is asking his disciples, but whom say ye that I am? The world will say a lot of things. People from different religions will claim a lot of things about me, Yeshua, Jesus, but whom say ye that I am? And so he is putting them to the test. He is assessing where they are in terms of their understanding of the spiritual things. Whom say ye? that I am. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And so the father is a person I prefer saying who is in heaven. And so Simon bar Jonah, Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, who hath told him this thing, who hath instructed him concerning this, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. And that is part of the nature of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father. And so the Father in heaven, he has taught you these things, Simon bar Jonah. Peter, flesh and blood, flesh and blood, the human intellect, the carnal mind hath not revealed this to you but my Father. And so it is by the Spirit that you have come to acquire such things, such knowledge, by the Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, things prepared for those whom God loves, those who obey His commandments, those who love Him and are known of Him and are His, and for whom this knowledge was prepared, because unto them it is given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. Unto them it is given to have faith on him, the truth, Yeshua, Jesus, and to partake in his sufferings. Philippians 1.29. And so as Peter Simon bar Jonah was able to discern with the help of the Spirit that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. You will see that there are people who being right in front of the truth still cannot wrap their mind around who is the truth. John chapter 18, verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, he's talking to Yeshua, Jesus. What is truth? And yet, according to John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus is the truth. Yeshua is the truth. But Pilate, being in front of the truth himself, is not able to discern it. What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. 
So Pilate did not have an understanding and discernment fully about what is truth. But something worked in him. The Lord worked something in him. He still wouldn't take action against the Lord, against truth. So Pilate's understanding was not complete here. And so I say these things so that we, again, looking at Simon and looking at Pilate, realize that in order to recognize and discern spiritual things and understand who is truth and the things that pertain to the heavenly kingdom, it is a matter of having our understanding opened by the spirit of wisdom and knowledge in God. And so God himself must instruct us. The Father, God, instructed Simon and revealed certain things to him. Pilate doesn't have a full revelation here, but he's led to act a certain way in which he will not defraud the Lord. And we had seen previously how Philip, not having his understanding yet fully open, struggled to understand that the truth was again in front of him. And he asked, show us the Father. When the Father in spirit was indwelling a vessel right in front of him in the person of Jesus Christ, the man, the Son of God. And so we see the importance of having the Spirit or the importance of being instructed by the Spirit to have our understanding open so that we can perceive, not only see, but perceive and understand things spoken in parables, having a language that is not the language of the world, having a wisdom that is not the wisdom rooted in the wisdom of this world, but rather having the spirit of wisdom that is heavenly and the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of God to tap into the understanding of spiritual things, things that the carnal man cannot receive, things that are prepared by God for people who obey him, love him, are known of him, and are his. And when you don't have these things, you are left in darkness being veiled and your understanding is clouded by the God of this world, the prince of this world, lest you should come to see the light and repent and be saved. We had spoken about this in Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 11. And so Peter received the revelation. Look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Yeshua, Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And so they obtain now the revelation. Who gives them that revelation? It is God himself, the Father, the Spirit, that opened their understanding for them to receive the revelation. This is the spirit of revelation of the knowledge of him. And that spirit of the knowledge of God communicated this knowledge unto the centurion as it had done for Peter. For Peter to say, thou art the son of the living God. But when you don't have that revelation, you are left in a cloud and in darkness and being unable to know the Lord, you do not see his light, you do not comprehend his truth, and you abide in error. And you are led by the spirit of error and abide in darkness, a cloud and darkness as the Egyptians who did not see the light of the pillar of fire. We are talking about the two-edged sword that comes out of the mouth of the Almighty, Yehoshua HaMashiach, and how it separates, and how you can be on one edge of the sword or the other, depending on whether you are a friend on the side of the pillar of fire, the camp of Israel, or a foe on the side of judgment and condemnation, darkness, that is the Egyptians. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And so this is the sharp two-edged sword. Are you a friend of God, as Abraham was, 
or are you a foe? As the Egyptians were separated from the camp of Israel. Revelation 19 verse 15, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, of Almighty God. Again, the sharp sword. And we learn about the purpose of one of the edges. It is to smite the nations. It is to, it is to render judgment. It is to execute judgment. It is to sentence the condemnation. And this concerning those who are foes, enemies of God, those who are friends with the world, different from those who are rather separated unto holiness by the other side of the two-edged sword, so that they can be a chaste virgin for Christ, so that they can be separated from wickedness. Because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. As we know, the sword is sharp, that two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It can discern the thoughts and intents of the heart, meaning again the idea that there is an access to privileged information which connects to being a friend of God on the right, on the proper side, on the proper side of the sword, the proper edge, which separates you unto holiness. It makes you a friend. It makes you privy to the information concerning the plan of God. It gives you access to spiritual discernment so that you can be a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart in the image of the Almighty. As you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, some have a gift of spiritual discernment. But even without that gift, by having the spirit in you, you are still very sensitive to the spiritual essence and nature of things. And so this is the idea of, of being on the inside in terms of spiritual things and their manifestations where you can discern, you can feel certain things. Without the spirit, you can't do that. And so the sword is sharp and it discerns. Hallelujah. And so we said, brothers and sisters, at the top, that the same Lord, the same God, was in the midst of both the camp of Israel and the Egyptians. But yet, that same being, that same God, the same Almighty, who is the light of the world, Yet he appeared one way unto those who had knowledge of him, and he appeared a different way unto those who did not have knowledge of him or rejected him. And so this is to show you that having one essence, or at least that being present in one place as one entity, the Lord is able to allow different groups of people to perceive different things about him, where he is one. And we know that he is the light of the world. John chapter one, verse nine, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. When you connect this to the story of the camp of Israel and the Egyptians, the Lord came in the middle as a sword, a two-edged sword, and he was light in the middle of both parties. He separated them. And so he came unto all these people, but unto one side, 
unto one edge of the sword, he was received. But concerning the other side of the sword on the other edge, he was not received. He came unto his own, he came unto his people, and his own received him not. And so you can look at this two ways. He came unto Israel and they received him not. But if you broaden the scope of this verse, he came into the world, but he was received of some and rejected by others. He came in the midst of the world in the image of the camp of Israel plus the Egyptians. He came in the midst of all these people. Some received him and some received him not. Some perceived his light, others did not. And when you get more specific now concerning the camp of Israel, even some within the camp of Israel will indeed receive him and others will not at a later stage to where only a few of them will make it out of the desert. But to not make things complicated, we will focus on the fact that the camp of Israel can be perceived as having received him and having seen the light, the pillar of fire, whereas the camp of the Egyptians did not receive him and could not perceive that light. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so there are those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There are those who were predestined to be conformed to his image, and they will know the new birth, the birth from above. They will be born again. And they will receive the Lord according to the plan of the Lord, and they will see his light. They will receive it. And they will be akin to the camp of Israel, who was able to perceive the light of the pillar of fire. But there are those who, being carnal, will end up in darkness, a cloud and darkness, being veiled, having their understanding veiled, and not be able to understand the things of the spirit and not be able to understand the mysteries of the kingdom because it is not given them. And the devil clouds their understanding. And just like the Pharisees, as we saw in John chapter nine, because they have the spirit of error, they think that they're in the truth but they don't realize that they're blind. And so Yehoshua, Jesus says, you are yet blind and will die in your sins because you think you see, but you don't see. John chapter three, verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And so the light came into the world, and some received him, some received him not. The light came in the midst of the camp of Israel and the Egyptians, and there were those who received him who saw the light, and there were those who had not received him and were plunged in darkness because their deeds were evil, because they opposed themselves to the will of the Almighty. When he would have his people go in the wilderness to worship him. Now we also understand that it was the plan of the Lord that he had set up Pharaoh even for this purpose of resisting Moses and the Lord, so that the power of the Lord would be made manifest on the earth. And so in his great council, the Lord had decided that Pharaoh would be called and set up even for this purpose. As the Lord also tells us in the book of Exodus, even for this purpose, Pharaoh, have I raised thee up. And so again, brothers and sisters, we are speaking about the sword, the double-edged sword, on the one side you have the friends of God, and on the other, the enemies of God, foes. 
and to a group it is given to see the light of God, the light of the pillar of fire, and to another it is not given, and they are plunged in darkness, a cloud and darkness, though both parties be looking at the same sword, but there are different aspects to that sword. And depending on your positioning, you will see something different because only one of the parties is able to see and perceive. Alleluia. Amen. Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so we are guided by the truth of the Lord in our walk as saints, just like the camp of Israel had its path lit by the light emitted by the pillar of fire. And this is the truth that we hold on to and keep close to our hearts so that we don't sin against the Lord. But without that lamp, you are lost in a cloud and darkness. You have your understanding veiled. And that was the case of the Egyptians. And this type of separation makes it so there is a knowledge that is only available for those who have their understanding opened. Revelation chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And Revelation chapter 14, verse 3, And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. And so the only point I want to bring about concerning this verse is that there are certain things that you can know and be in the knowing of certain things only if it is given you. And so they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And this is the interesting part. No man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. And so that that group is given a special understanding and they come into the knowledge of a heavenly thing because it's given them to understand it. And so this is concerning this specific group. But this is to highlight that when the Lord is making a separation between groups, there is an understanding that may be given to one group and not to the other. There is a knowledge of God that you can have if it is given you while it is not given to another. And so the sword, the two-edged sword, it separates. And God gives understanding and opens the understanding of each and every one of us in the way that he so chooses. And so yet again, brothers and sisters, we are talking about the two-edged sword, the sword that divides, that separates the righteous from the wicked, the sword that separates the saints from the unbelievers, the sword that separates unto sanctification and holiness, the sword that sets at variance against the Lord those who have chosen to speak the language of this world, those who love this world and have become friends of the world, the enemies of God. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And the man's foes shall be they of his own household. And so again, the Lord is expressing to us 
that the sword that comes out of his mouth, the two-edged sword, it cuts asunder between soul and spirit. It cuts asunder even between family members. In a household of five, it will be three against two. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? And so, remember the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4? The sower soweth the seed, and the seed is the word. The word of God is preached unto every creature under heaven. But to some, this word, acting as a two-edged sword, has the following effect. They do not receive it. Or, having received it, it does not abide in them. And it causes them to choose to set themselves at variance against God and become enemies of God. And they are foes of God. And they now abide on the side of the sword, where the edge of the sword is for judgment unto condemnation. And to some, the same word, one word that is preached, just like there was one God in between the camp of Israel and the Egyptians, the one word in the midst of the world separates on the one side foes, enemies of God, who will not obey this word because it doesn't find root in their heart. And on the other side, on the other edge of the sword, you have those who receive it and will bear fruit and will be separated unto holiness. And so what I want to point out here is that the same word creates division and the same word not being received by some, they hear it, but by not abiding by this word, they now embrace death and they live a life of sin, being separated from the Lord spiritually and they die in their sins and then it is the second death when they are spiritually condemned to the lake of fire on the day of judgment. And so they are dead while living and die in the flesh to then go on to the judgment eventually to be sentenced to eternal death. And so the word has a flavor of death unto them because it brings them to a place of death where they abide. First during their life, their earthly life, and then at the time of judgment, where they are eternally condemned to the lake of fire. To them, the word as a savor of death, and it leads unto death, death unto death. The same word, the same seed that is planted, some will not receive it. And it creates a separation between this first group of people and the other group of people who will receive this word, receive the life of it, so that they can live in righteousness and sanctification and not be spiritually dead while they live in their earthly tabernacle. And then after the first death, which is physical, they do not know the second death, the eternal condemnation to the lake of fire, but rather they inherit eternal life. And so the word itself becomes a sword, but the Lord is the word with a capital W. The Lord is truth. The Lord is life. And so the word, the seed, life, truth to the one, because they don't receive it, it becomes death unto death. And to those who receive it, it becomes life unto life. We are talking about the two-edged sword that creates division. And therefore today, brothers and sisters, you must take a stand. Are you on the one side of the sword or the other? Are you a friend or are you a foe? 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. You cannot serve two masters. Will you be a friend of God or a friend of the world? You have to choose and make a decision because if you try to live with one foot on each side of the fence, then the Lord says you are lukewarm and he will spit you out of his mouth. Malachi 3.18 
Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. The sword will separate who is righteous and who is wicked. And so the Lord makes a difference between those who serve him and those who serve him not. Let us go back to the story of Exodus. Look at how the Lord makes a difference between those who are friends and those who are foes. Exodus chapter 10, verse 22. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And so you see, my friends, that even when there is a thick darkness in the land, there are people who still abide in the light because the Almighty is their shield and exceeding confidence. There are those who have the word as a lamp at their feet. And so the Lord made a difference and allowed some to be in light while others were in darkness. The Lord allowed again by way of the pillar of fire for the camp of Israel to have light while not allowing the Egyptians to have light but rather be in a cloud and darkness. God makes a difference. Same thing when it came time to cross the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 14, verse 27. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them, but the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. The same water, the same body of water, for a group of people, the children of Israel, the camp of Israel, who are in the light, the same water manifests as a wall. But to those who are in darkness, the same water is made up of rushing waves that cover them and they perish. The same element, water, to the one it manifests in one way, and to the other, it manifests in a different way. Remember how the same God, the same Almighty, who is light, who was in the midst of the camp of Israel and the Egyptians, he was in the midst of them both. And on the one side, he appeared as light, on the other as darkness. Likewise, the sea, on the one hand, it appeared as walls, on the other, crashing waves. We are talking about the sword that divides the one element that comes in between and has two edges, one unto separation and salvation, the other unto judgment and condemnation. We are talking about the divine judgment of the Almighty who has a sword coming out of his mouth, a two-edged sword. But there are some who will not receive that light. John chapter 6, verse 70 Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? And so Jesus was surrounded by his disciples, and he was one being, one person. He was Jesus. He was Yehoshua in the midst of them, and they all were exposed to him, the truth, the way, the life. But what was the end result? Just like the word, when the word is given to the whole earth, some receive it, some don't. And then you had Jesus, the bread of life. He was offered unto the world. He was offered unto his disciples in communion. But there was one who would not receive it. Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. Matthew chapter 26, verse 23. And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. They all ate the same bread of life, but there is one who would not receive the life of that bread, as there are who will not receive the light of the world, as there are who will not receive 
the truth of God and will not walk in the way of God. And therefore, they will not know the resurrection of God. But for those who accept his word, they will get a glimpse of his light. You cannot see the whole thing just yet because he cannot be contained, no, not even by the heavens. But you can get a glimpse of him if you will have fellowship with him, if you will accept him as your Lord and Savior, if you will recognize him as the almighty Adonai. Hallelujah. Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me, and live. Remember that in the midst of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel came down the angel of the Lord, a manifestation of the Almighty, in a form that can be perceived in the physical, but it wasn't the pure form of the Almighty. Verse 20, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And so though you cannot see the Lord in his fullness, though you cannot see his face just yet, you can still get a glimpse of his light, of his person, because you have chosen to be on the side of the edge of the sword that is unto life, unto truth, unto salvation, and unto the wisdom and the knowledge of his person. And so you are not in total darkness. Amen. But brothers and sisters, the good news is that on that day, we will see him as he is, my friend, when the Lord will appear. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so we wait, brothers and sisters, for that day when we will see the Lord as he is. And we'll no longer be seeing things through a veil, but rather see him plainly. Alleluia. And when I say that we see him through a veil, we're not talking about the veil of blindness that veils the unbelievers, but rather we're saying that we can perceive part of the light of the Lord and the full disclosure of that light. We will have it and see it on that day. Amen. And so Moses saw the back parts, meaning Moses had a glimpse. He saw in part. Alleluia. I'm saying this because we are talking about the fact that those who choose God, those who are friends of God, they get to see the light, part of the light at least, whereas those who don't receive the Lord, don't, don't submit to his authority, they are plunged in darkness and abide there on the side of the edge of the sword that is unto judgment and condemnation. Revelation chapter 19, verse 16 and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so, brothers and sisters, what he has written on his thigh, only the bride, the spouse, will see. And this is us, those who have put our faith in Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so not only do we get a glimpse at light, we have a glimpse at intimacy with the Lord, hallelujah, where we have laid eyes upon his thigh. And this is for the beloved, hallelujah, those who are on the side of friendship and communion with God, even his spouse, his bride, the church, hallelujah. And so I spoke of the church, the bride. This is about those who love the Lord, those who thirst after the Lord. Let us read the type of love that we are talking about. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 2. Let him kiss me 
with the kisses of his mouth. For thy love is better than wine. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. And so this is the type of love that we have for the Lord. The love that he even has put into us because he has loved us first and we have received his love wherewith we are able to love him back with all our heart and to love even our fellow man. We love him because he has shown us love. He is love, 1 John 4, 8, and his name, which is above every name, so that at the name of Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, on earth, and beneath the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is Lord to the glory of the Father. This is the one who has an excellent name. This is the one we love, and this is the one that we run after because he has drawn us to him. And he is a king, the king of kings and lord of lords. We will remember thy love more than wine, because your spiritual love is much better than the wine of this earth, which pleases the flesh and makes the heart of man merry. But... We want the spiritual treasures of your person. Alleluia. The upright love thee. Those who are friends, those who are the spouse, those who are on the side of the edge of the sword that leads to separation unto salvation, not the foes, not the enemies, on the other side of the sword, on the edge of the sword that is judgment executed upon the wicked. We want to be like the camp of Israel and perceive the light of the fire of the pillar of fire and not like the Egyptians who were in the darkness. We want to have the water of life. Alleluia. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. He has an excellent name. We have mentioned it and it is better than the precious ointments that we can make in this world. And the day of death than the day of one's birth. Remember how Paul says that to him, death is a gain because he gets to be with Christ immediately. And so therefore it is better to die and to be with Christ than to be born in this world that is corrupt with lust, where one will suffer and battle the flesh the sinful flesh. It is a life of torment as you battle the flesh. And Paul said, who will deliver me of this body of condemnation, this sinful flesh? And so we await to be delivered from that flesh. And on the day of death, the first death, separation of the spirit and body, we in spirit can now be with Christ. And so this was gain to Paul. And this is why we can say that the day of death is better than the day of one's birth. And so if we look again at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we read the following to confirm what we have just said. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And so life under the sun is very difficult. There are a lot of oppressions when you are living under the sun in the flesh. But if you have a comforter, if you have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is your comforter, it is something that will allow you to get through it because you have hope. You have hope of a better country. We finish the verse. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comforter. Verse 2. Wherefore I praised the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. In other words, those who have relinquished the tabernacle, the body 
the sinful flesh, they are delivered from it, as Paul explained. Who will deliver me from this body of death? So that they can go on in the spirit to be with Christ, which is far better. And so it is better to have suffered the first death and to have moved on in spirit to be with Christ. You are in a better position than those who are still living with the oppressions that come with having this sinful body of flesh. Verse 3. Yea, better is he than both they, which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. And this is interesting. Here, the preacher, Solomon, tells us that it is even better to not have known the oppressions that occur when you live in the sinful flesh under the sun. And this gives you an idea of just how bad it is to be alive in that sinful flesh and what type of oppression you are going to be subjected to in that he is saying it is better not to have known that though you would have been delivered of it having died and moved on in the spirit. Yea, better is he than both they, those who are alive, those who have passed after having been alive, you are better off than both they, he which hath not yet been, who was not yet born, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. He who is not yet born and has yet to see the evil under the sun, he is in the best position because he has not experienced the oppression of the sinful flesh because it is that bad. And so this is what the preacher is telling us here. But as we have come to be alive, we must remember that it is best for us to have hope in the comforter because he brings comfort and he allows us to stay the course and run the race until the end so that we have a reward and the glory to come will not compare to the hardship that we experience under the sun in the sinful flesh. Uh, if we at least have hope in the comforter, we can bear it. Lastly, brothers and sisters, this is the sum of the whole matter. We need to fear the Lord and remember that we are but dust. We are but men. Psalm chapter 9, verse 20. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Brothers and sisters, we serve an almighty, powerful God who sits on his throne in heaven. Let us be quiet and keep silence before him. Let us be slow to speak and quick to listen to what he wants to teach us, wanting us to have instruction by receiving the things of his spirit let us put our faith in him and believing on him and abiding in his truth and obeying his commandments to love him so that we have knowledge of him by way of the spirit of wisdom, by way of the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him. Let him instruct us and open our understanding so that we may see and perceive, hear and understand that we be not like the Egyptians caught in a cloud of darkness, but rather that we can have a glimpse of the light emitted by the pillar of fire, that when we are confronted to the sword that causes division and separates between righteousness and wickedness, we may end up on the side of the edge of the sword where friends of the Lord abide, where the spouse abides where there has been a separation unto holiness and righteousness, unto becoming a chaste virgin for Christ, unto the side that leads to eternal life and having been set apart this way by that one sword. Yet that one sword, let us not be on the other side, on the side of the edge that is unto judgment, unto eternal condemnation where those who abide there are foes, enemies of the Lord, who are friends with the world and who have set themselves up as enemies of God and concerning whom God reserveth wrath 
for them. The things of the Lord are obtained only by his spirit who teaches us all things. The anointing that we have received teaches us all things. And the Lord teaches us through men also established as teachers. And it is only by him that we obtain revelation about his person, his being, and get to know him as our father. Because flesh and blood cannot reveal it to us. Because there are things that are only available through the spirit and can only be acquired by the spirit. And these are spiritual things prepared for those who love the Lord, are known of him, having his spirit, and are his, those who walk in righteousness, obeying his commandments. Because the Lord does say in Revelation chapter 22, that no dogs are going to be allowed in the kingdom, in the new Jerusalem, no witches, no evil doers, the practicers of iniquity will not be there. My friends, you can now assess whether you are a friend of God or an enemy of God. And I pray that as we are not called to judge anything before the time, that you may come to the knowing of the Lord, his person, his being, his glorious light, that he may take you out of darkness and bring you into his marvelous light because his arm is not too short to save. So that you can have a glimpse of the light that is emitted by the pillar of fire and not be blinded and have your understanding taken hostage as the devil would veil your ability to perceive the things of the kingdom. My prayer is that unto you it be given to understand the mystery of the kingdom. Friend or foe, the two edges of the sword of the Almighty God. May you be blessed, brothers and sisters, in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Amen.